I have uh, two great kids. One of them's here today, my 14-year-old. My oldest, uh, my daughter, uh, is away at college now, but she had a terrific high school golf career. And she was playing in the state championship in Springfield, Massachusetts in June 2011. A couple days before a uh, tornado had hit Springfield. And as you can see, you know, the, the devastation in this community was, was unbelievable. There was a four block long by two block wide area of Springfield that was completely flattened by the tornado. A few months later, at the end of August, Hurricane Irene swept up through the Connecticut River Valley. There were 251 cities and towns in Vermont. 225 of those suffered infrastructure damage. The end of October uh, 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit. $68 billion worth of damage done by that storm alone. I'm uh, interested in this guy over here. He owns an asset. It may not have occurred to him at this point, but he's going to be wondering how much his insurance premium is going to be, or even if he's going to be able to get insurance. One of the things that I really like about, uh, about this cartoon, though, is that there's a triangle around that sign. Think of it as energy stress points that we particularly feel here in New England. I'm sure you all have felt it this winter. Everybody's electricity bills went up this winter, yes. Natural gas bills up quite a bit. The top of the, the, the energy stress triangle, stress on the grid, there's a lot of grid stress that we're experiencing. Some of that is actually coming to, to media attention now, which is good, grid security issues. Uh, issues with uh, building out the infrastructure. We have an old grid infrastructure here in New England. And then stress on the environment down here. So when I look at the solutions that legislators are trying to put together, usually what happens is any legislative solution is effective in relieving stress in two of these points. Okay? It might be that it relieves stress in the rate payer in the grid, but at the cost of the environment. Or it might be that it relieves stress on the environment and the grid, but it increases stress on the right pair. One of the very few things that I know of that releases stress on all three points of this triangle is energy efficiency. You know, the cheapest kilowatt for the right pair is the one that's never used. The less kilowatts we use, the less stress, obviously, on the grid. And the cleanest kilowatt's the one that's never used as well. I'm a real estate agent, I sell homes, I don't sell climate change solutions. But that being said, our industry, the real estate industry, has a fantastic opportunity to be part of a solution. And in fact, this map up above me is part of that solution. These homes are more energy efficient than their neighbors. The homes that we live in throughout the U.S. account for 22% of our energy usage, what we use to heat cool, light our homes, and all the appliances and gadgets we have. This is what the map looked like in 2001. It was empty. Energy Star Certification for Homes started in 2001. National Green Building Standards started in 2007. Lead for Homes, administered by the U.S. Green Building Council, didn't start until 2008. This is a great marketplace to be in. It's a great opportunity for us. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on right now at the above the treetops level to support this market transformation that I'm talking about today. I'm going to talk about a friend of mine instead. This is a guy named Ed. He and his wife Jennifer bought a house in Newton, Massachusetts in 1980. It was heated uh, with a coal-fired fireplace that had been adapted to use oil. So you can imagine how clean and energy efficient that was. Today, Ed's house produces more energy than it uses on an annual basis. I'll give you some perspective on that. Probably what most of you see here is a matchstick burning. What energy geeks see when we take a look at this is that it's a BTU. When this match, matchstick burns all the way to the end, it will have produced enough heat to move a pound of water from 39 to 40 degrees. That's the definition of a BTU. The average home here in Massachusetts uses 109 million of these every year to heat, light, and cool their home. 109 million. The first time we used an atomic weapon in warfare was over the Japanese city of uh, Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. The release in that millisecond of the atomic bomb released 
60 billion matchsticks in that moment. It only takes 550 homes in Massachusetts one year to consume the amount of energy that that atomic weapon released. So how did Ed get to the place where he bought a home that had no insulation in it to a home that's now net zero, producing as much energy, energy as it's using on an annual basis? Well, the first thing he did was he realized he had a problem. Uh, and he realized he had the problem, he and Jennifer had a problem, after they got through the first winter, and they saw their energy bills were through the roof. And they were quite literally through the roof because there was no insulation up there, right? They changed that old uh, heating unit they had. They replaced it with one that was much more efficient. So Ed saw this opportunity to lower his operating costs, to get control of his operating costs. That's where his journey started. Then, in the late 80s, he got interested in this guy, James Hansen. He was a scientist for NASA. And Hansen was testifying in front of the Senate in the late 80s. What Hansen was saying was, uh, look, you know, the more CO2 we emit into the atmosphere, that's actually creating a blanket in our atmosphere. It's insulating the atmosphere. It's trapping heat that normally bounces back off into space. And the effects might be devastating. Ed took a, 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 a real interest in Hansen. And his perspective changed. It went from moving from being an opportunity to lower his operating costs to more of an obligation. Because he knew that every dollar that he wasn't giving to the utility company was less BTUs that he was producing in his home, was less carbon emissions that he was responsible for. So Ed started to feel an obligation to his community, to the environment. In 2002, he bought his first solar PV unit, small two kilowatt system. 2006, he bought his first electric vehicle. 2010, 2011, Ed told me he had a revelation. He increased the size of the solar PV unit to an eight kilowatt sy system and invested in something that was only beginning to be effective enough to be used here in the Northeast called an air source heat pump. Now, his home, produces enough energy to heat, light, cool his home, all his gadgets, plus it powers one and a half of his cars. He has that full electric vehicle. This is Ed's service station in his garage. And he has what he calls his gas guzzle, or his hybrid. I, I'm in a kind of unique space because I have an energy efficiency background. I have a real estate background. And I saw, frankly, a business opportunity. That opportunity turned into an obligation for me. An obligation to my children, to the communities that I live and I work in, to the environment. I hope you'll join me. Thank you.